So yes, hello everyone. Um, my name is Ian Farr. I'm a product manager in Microsoft's Identity and Network Access division. Uh, what does that mean? Well, I help some of Microsoft's biggest customers define their identity strategy and I help them deploy Azure Active Directory. And all the while really collecting feedback um, to help improve our product. I'm also part of a, a V team that I've recently joined uh, working on our identity PowerShell experience. And hence the reason I'm here speaking to you today. So as you can see, I'm, I'm not there in person. I'm currently sat in my home office. I really wanted to be out there in person, um, but sadly circumstances conspired against me. So hopefully next year. And I really hope you've had a great week so far as well. I'm very jealous. So I like to do live demos. So stuff will probably go wrong, but that's part of the fun. And also if you need to ask a question, I can see into the room actually on one of my screens. So raise your hand and apparently there's a mic in the room that you can use as well. So it gets on the recording and I can hear you. All right then, on with the session. So welcome to one module to rule Azure Active Directory. So in terms of what we're gonna cover, history and landscape, um, how to get started with Graph PowerShell if you haven't had a look at it already, modern authentication and how that relates to Graph PowerShell, uh, some common identity tasks if you're in the identity space and that you can do with Graph PowerShell, how to upgrade, to Graph PowerShell and what we're doing in that particular space. And then just a little bit at the end about contributing and some of the, the recent community contributions as well. All right, so onto history and landscape. Um, I guess to get started, just a, a bit of a level set. So let's take a quick look at what Azure AD is. I'm sure most of you are aware, but in a modern enterprise environment, we, we, we see the following trends really. Um, the network perimeter is disappearing, resources are gradually moving to the cloud. There's, there's been this explosion of devices and, and applications and, and your, your standard employee or just anyone really has a, a, a plethora, a multiple set of identities now. And, and they could connect from anywhere and they use multiple devices. So for the modern IT admin to secure, manage and govern those trends, then we have Azure AD as, a, as the control plane. If you like, it's the, the common denominator that runs through the modern enterprise. So that's the level set um, onto the PowerShell now. So I'm just, uh, in Identity PowerShell, we have, we have four modules today for interacting with Azure AD. And these are MS Online, Azure AD PowerShell, Azure AD PowerShell Preview, and the most recent, which is the Microsoft Graph PowerShell SDK or Graph PowerShell as I call it in shorthand. And when it comes to PowerShell and Microsoft Identity, we also have several other modules and you're probably familiar with Windows Server AD module. And then we have a bunch of other sort of non-official modules that are published under the Azure AD GitHub organization. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about those later. But if we look at those four official modules, I'm gonna actually use a table to compare these, which is interesting for a presentation, but let's see how it goes. Um, so, the values I have in the table are API coverage. So how much of the existing API landscape or API functionality does the module make use of? Always up to date. So yeah, how often does the actual module get released? What's the, what's the release cycle? Have you got the latest, greatest functionality at your fingertips? Um, is it cross-platform? So does it work on more than Windows? Is it open source? Uh, yep. Is it available to the community? Documentation. So what's the state of the documentation, the help that exists inside the commandlets and outside the commandlets? And usability. So as an IT pro familiar with PowerShell, you should just be able to pick up the module and use it, right? Okay, so th those are our sort of comparison criteria. Now, if I move on to the first module, this is the MS Online module. It's released in 2012. And yes, 2012, that does make me feel old. Um, its name comes from the Microsoft Online Services. So th these are an early name for our, our cloud offerings. And you may see this referred to as, as V1. So when we think about API coverage, yes, it's limited, it has a small amount of functionality, but still actually core and critical functionality. Uh, is it always up to date? No, periodic releases and it hasn't been updated for a little while. Cross-platform? No, just Windows. Open source? Certainly not. Documentation? Yeah, I'd say pretty good, um, although it maybe needs some updates by now. And usability, as an IT pro, can just pick it up and use it as expected. So the next module, is Azure AD and actually by Social Azure, Azure AD Preview. This was released in 2015 and actually by far remains our, our popu most popular module uh, 
in terms of usage and when it comes to automating against Azure AD with PowerShell. You may see this one referred to as V2. And when it comes to API coverage, I'd say substantial. There's a decent amount of functionality available to you. Is it always up to date? No, again, we have periodic release cycles. Cross-platform, again, just Windows. Open source, no. And just like MS Online, good documentation. Well, very good documentation, I would say, and, and good usability. So now we have the, the latest addition to our, our, our module story. So Graph PowerShell, 2020, it arrived. It has human augmented code. Uh, so it has human augmented, let's get this right, code generated commandlets. And you know that concept of auto-generating commandlets isn't new, as I'm sure, you know. So back in the days of PowerShell v3, the, the common inflammation model, which I always used to sort of pronounce as Kim, but maybe it's sim. Uh, it had the, the common information model anyway, had, had sim classes that allowed us to auto-generate commandlets. And, and CDX and was that wrapper. So this auto-generation thing definitely isn't new. And I would say when it comes to graph PowerShell, we look at the telemetry, it's gaining momentum and, it, and it's improving all the time. And the, the API coverage for it, anything that's in Microsoft Graph uh, ends up in the PowerShell module really. And the Microsoft Graph covers more than just identity as well. It is a whole sort of end-to-end -end stack of, of the Microsoft Cloud services you can, you can interface with. Is it always up to date? Yes. Um, there's a monthly release cycle in fact. So auto-generated commandlets mean that we can cover all the new APIs. Is it cross-platform? Very much so, Windows, Linux, Mac OS, open source. Yes, you can go and find it out there on GitHub. Document documentation, I, I put there improving. So yeah, I'd say we're playing catch up here. We, we, we are human augmenting the documentation and we're working on uh, better machine generated documentation as well. And usability, and it, it's a similar story really. So there's some things that IT pros, and, and I class myself as an IT pro, I came from a, a sysadmin background before joining Microsoft, used PowerShell for a number of years, both outside and inside Microsoft. So there's a number of things that I and others would take for granted that actually are missing, or we may have to do things in a, a slightly different or unexpected way. So that's the module comparison. Um, so I really wanted to call out today, which is the fact that we recently, so that was start of March, 2022, we, we recently announced that the MS Online and JD modules are flagged for deprecation. So why not really a surprise to many that this is happening? Um, it's actually the first time we, we've publicly gone and stated it. And this, this happened alongside an announcement that the JD Graph API, on which the JD PowerShell module has a dependency, uh, was not going to be retired this June, which was causing uh, quite a lot of consternation out in the community. Um, although it does remain uh, deprecated and is actually targeted for retirement. And that leads me on to my next point. So you'll see us talking about deprecation, and we define deprecated as no new functionality being developed, being developed, sorry, um, but it is still supported. Whereas retirement, retired, is the removal of a feature or service, i.e., it stops working at a given point. So when it comes to these modules, yeah, they're, they're flagged for deprecation. In reality, that, that announcement means that um, our, our customers, the community, uh, have much uh, so consider more time to to upgrade to graph powershell and then we have more time to work on facilitating that process which is something I, something i'm really keen to do all right so i mentioned landscape as well so what, what's the current landscape and again a table i'd love to know if this is working out but uh, so what are our attributes in this in this table? And, and I'm going to compare Graph PowerShell to the, the Azure AD PowerShell module. So I guess compare the, the most used uh, to the strategic and newest module. The attributes here, required major PS version, speaks for itself. Public cloud endpoint, so which API is used for the connectivity. Underlying authentication library. So actually when we drive uh, the authentication to through the module, uh, what are we using in terms of libraries? Uh, that's important. And then what's the development process? So how, how the commandlets are actually made. So if we start with Graph PowerShell, required major PS version 5.1 plus, so it supports Windows PowerShell, but actually you should be using it on PowerShell 7. That goes without saying really, but um, it's, it's worth calling out, it does support 5.1. Public cloud API endpoint, it calls graph.microsoft.com. 
when it comes to the underlying authentication library. So it uses this thing called MCell, so Microsoft Authentication Libraries. What that means is you get the, the latest and greatest authentication options, such as passwordless, which I'll talk about in a bit and demo, and demo as well. The development process for this one, yeah, as you can read it there, the command that's auto-generated as mentioned, and they're generated by this thing called the auto-rest tool. Um, yeah, again, out there on GitHub, they can be augmented by humans, by us, by people. For example, this thing called customization can be added for additional behavior or documentation can be expanded. And I'll come to customizations later as well. But Azure AD PowerShell module yeah, five only, uh, it's a Windows PowerShell public API endpoint, that's graph.windows.net. And that is actually um, deprecated. So it will be retired in the future. It uses the active directory authentication libraries, and those are also marks of deprecated. And the development process is mostly human authored. So that's really all the scene setting. So we, we've touched upon the history of the PowerShell modules used to administer Azure AD and PowerShell. Uh, we also compared the most used module with our newest and strategic module graph PowerShell. So let's, now let's take a look at what you need to do to get started with graph PowerShell. So when getting started, for me, it's always best to understand why you're using a new tool, a new approach. And when it comes to Graph PowerShell, then it has these advantages. And, you know, some of these we touched upon in the context setting. Um, so it supports PowerShell 7, multi-platform, covers the entire MS Graph API, has monthly updates, supports modern authentication, specifically passwordless. What I haven't mentioned so far is it comes with a least privileged module. The, the client that's used for uh, Azure AD PowerShell uh, by default has a number of privileges within the directory that intersect actually with your user privileges. But this out of the box, you have to add permissions in via the consent model. Um, again, that raises the bar a little bit for adoption, but actually I believe it's it's a good thing once you understand the concept. So it adheres to least privilege. Um, open source as mentioned. It has this notion of advanced queries. So we can actually do, rather than doing uh, say client side filtering to do things like measuring objects or, or counting specifically, we can actually use server side um, in, in terms of how we make the query. And there's a whole bunch of uh, really sort of rapid, fast searching and filtering we can do via the actual uh, module itself. And it supports, supports external authentication. What do I mean by that? Um, so B2B is a technology in Azure AD that allows you to invite in users from a third party tenant to access your services in your own tenant. Um, and it supports that particular pattern as well. So those are the benefits. Oh, and one I missed, no need for wrappers. So I guess prior to the graph PowerShell module, um, people had to use, people had to write wrappers for dealing with the MS Graph API. And wrappers such as you know, token acquisition and uh, refreshing a token, and then actually calling the API and, and doing things like pagination. And there's a whole bunch of these things out there. I wrote my own. And, well, they're incredibly useful. All of that is taken away just by using the Graph PowerShell SDK. So again, lowering the bar for adoption for people that want to use um, MS Graph. Alrighty, so now for a very short demo um, on how you get up and running. And let me see if this is gonna work nicely. Wait, okay. Hopefully you can all see that. Are you okay at the back? Is that yes? Excellent, thank you. Um, so yeah, this first section here is really about installing the module. And I'm not gonna labor it because it's stuff that we should have all done before, but as expected, you can use install module to actually get the module up and running from the PowerShell gallery. Um, if you install uh, all the sub modules, Oh, am I in the right place? No, I'm not, so I apologize. It's here I'm referring to. If you install all the sub modules, then actually when I put this slide together, the whole graph PowerShell module was taking up around 638 MB of this space, um, which is quite a lot really. There's a lot in there, there's a lot of commandlets in there. So something I just want to call out, and I'm, and I'm not gonna do this today because it's a bit of a boring demo, is the fact that actually you can pick out sub modules. So you, you can use a find module command, and I've just selected all the ones here that pertain to identity 
um, put a wildcard on the end of it and just pipe it into the install module. And that way you just get the identity modules. It automatically installs the authentication module for you. Um, so that's just a handy little tip. And that was the shortest demo in the world ever. And probably the most boring, but there we go. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the slides temporarily and then hopefully get to a bit of a meteor demo. Right, so uh, let's have a look. So modern authentication then. I, I guess really one of the really cool things about Graph PowerShell is that it supports this notion of modern auth, as we call it. And you think of that as the use of MFA, multi-factor authentication. And it does this, as, as you'll recall, via the, the Microsoft authentication libraries. Now, for me, one of the really cool things is about modern auth is that you can do passwordless. So passwords suck, you know, and, and they, you know why. They're typically easy to guess and they can be replayed across a number of services. And why wouldn't you get rid of them? And passwordless gives us the ability to actually authenticate without a password. And the Graph PowerShell module supports that. If we look in the Microsoft stack, then we have today three passwordless technologies. And these give a really good, a sort of really seamless user experience. And that's underpinned by strong security. And the, the first of those technologies is something called Windows Hello for Business. And maybe you're using that in your own organization. And here we use this thing called a gesture. So it could be a biometric or the like a facial recognition or the input of a pin, um, basically to sign into Windows. And, and Graph PowerShell can make use of Windows Hello for Business. The second one is using the Microsoft Authenticator app. And here we enter a code that's presented during the authentication flow. And on the auth app, then we have to complete the signing by typing in that code and confirming it's us. Um, so no, and then it's usually followed up actually by a, a a pin or a biometric on a, on a device if you have that configured as well. So uh, again, there, there's, there's no passwords and graph supports it. And lastly, and this is the one I'll demo today, we have these things called FIDO2 security keys. Uh, so FIDO2 is an industry standard that is developed about passwordless auth. And these keys, they contain a credential, uh, your identifier, so who you are and a, a secret. And you supply that key during the authentication flow and then you enter a pin typically, and then you interact with it in some form. So I've got ones that scan a fingerprint and the one here today, you just, just press it. And after completing that flow, you're logged in and yep, Graph PowerShell supports that, as you probably guessed. All right, so on to then hopefully a more interesting demo this time. Where am I going? Here we are. So this is the key, the FIDO2 security key. Um, USB based plugs into my work laptop and that's the bit where I interact with it. So I'm just going to plug it in now. And if I try and authenticate to one of my tenants, so I'm going to use the connect MG graph, I'm going to actually specify some scopes. So this, if you remember we talked about least privilege, this is a permission I'm going to request as part of this logon. Now, if I've already got the permission, it's great. It just goes ahead and logs me in. If I don't have the permission, it takes me through what's called the consent flow. If I'm an admin, I can consent to that for myself or for the whole org. If I'm not an admin, um, then if it's configured, I can ask uh, the admin for that permission via a flow that we have in Azure AD. Um, I already have that permission, so it's not gonna ask me for it. And I'm actually gonna switch to my console here. Okay. So it now takes me to a browser to complete the authentication. So you know I mentioned it supports Windows Hello for Business. So this is my Microsoft account. I'm on my Microsoft laptop. If I click on that, then I actually I'll log in with um, my Microsoft account, which I log into the laptop with with Windows Hello for Business. So that's how you, that's how you get to it. If I connected to Windows, I'm going to use this account because this is what well, this is my test tenant. Um, okay. So last time I signed in, I didn't use the FIDO2 security key. It usually would take me straight to it, but actually this time it hasn't. So I'm gonna choose other ways to sign in. And you see here, I've got other options. So I've got use Windows Hello or security key. We've recently added the ability to sign in with a certificate, CBA, but I'm gonna click on this. And now it begins the flow. So it goes back to Windows and says, enter my pin. And hopefully I remember what it is. And now see it says, touch my security key. So that just proves that I'm present and correct. I'm logged in. And now I can close this window here. 
go back to my host and it tells me, welcome to Microsoft Graph. I can now run a command just to see under what context that I'm logged in. So get mg context. It tells me some information about the login. So the actual permissions that that account has, who I'm logged in as, um, the auth type delegated. So this is actually me as a user authenticating to the application that exists in Azure AD for Graph PowerShell. And let me go back to this bit here. I can change the profile type. So what I'm going to do is run all these three together to save a bit of time and then tell you about them. So the first one changes the profile. Oh, why is it doing that? I think it's okay. That's typically because I have another account in another PowerShell session. But anyway, um, so that this one here, when I'm actually logged into Graph, there's a V1 endpoint, which you can think of as GA, and then there's a beta endpoint, so public preview essentially. And within this module today, you can switch between these two endpoints with this command. So select MG profile, dot name beta. Beta, as you'd expect, exposes a lot more functionality, um, but the point it, it is public preview. So I've switched to the, the beta endpoint here. What I've also then done is actually use one of the commandlets to call back uh, what is essentially the, Mar the, the Microsoft Graph PowerShell application that exists in Azure AD. So to be able to run Graph PowerShell, I have to have an application against which is used uh, to then interface with the Microsoft Graph API itself. So that's just some detail about the application there. Okay. Oh, I mean, that's not scrolling very fast. So finally, I should have disconnected the session. Now, what you can do is you can use this client ID notion here to connect to a different application. So we, we don't just have to use that Microsoft Graph application. We can use another one that we've created. And this allows us to actually adhere to these privileges. So we can create an application for a specific purpose and give users just access to the application or allow the application itself to run as a daemon and do automated uh, actions within our tenant. So I can, use, I can use a delegated login, but you saw that before. So in this instance, I'm gonna just demonstrate actually logging into this particular application, but using a certificate that's configured on the application. And I'm in, and if I run that command again, get mg context, this time you see the permissions I've got by the scopes. You can see that actually I've got a certificate name. My auth type this time is app only. So I'm, I'm actually under the, running under the context of the application itself, not as, a, not as a user. And you'll see there's no account down here. And then this is just the app name. So this is a different app that I've created in my tenant for automated sort of application activity. Uh, we should stop dropping that back down there. Let's go back up. Alrighty, so that's the command that I ran before to get the app info, and I'm just going to disconnect and log back in as my original user as well. Says he. So as I'm signed in, I don't have to go through the, the FIDO authentication again. That actual sign-in is cached within MSAP. So it maintains a cache, which is why we see sort of multiple accounts as well. And you can do account picking in terms of the session. Okay. So let's go back to the slides. So I wanted to demonstrate some more interesting tasks, should we say, from an IT admin point of view. And a lot of what you'll see in this next section is really things you can only do today with Graph PowerShell, because that's where we're making all of our, our sort of current and future investments in terms of the functionality that's available to you. Uh, 
I guess before I get to that point, I want to talk about this notion of a toolbox. So uh, a while back, I used to teach PowerShell fundamentals, and I wanted students to think about a toolbox containing get help, get command, and get member as their means of, of navigating and, and learning about PowerShell. So if, if they've learned nothing else, just use those three command lists and use them to actually explore and find out what they're doing. And I thought, well, potentially a similar concept would be useful for graph PowerShell. So I'm starting to promote a toolbox containing three command lists. Again, find mggraph command, find mggraph permission, and invoke mggraph request. And I'll show you those now. So here they are in the toolbox. Um, so graph PowerShell is big, you know, and it, especially if you install, install all of those modules and, and find mggraph command is exactly what it says on the tin. It finds commands. So here I know a command, but I want to get some information about it. I actually want to find out what the permissions that that command needs to run, because that's one of the, I found one of the bars to actually start using this module that, okay, I, I run the command, but it comes back and tells me insufficient permission, but it doesn't tell me what I need a lot of the time. So how do I find out? Well, find mggraph command helps with that. So here it tells me that this particular one, it needs all these permissions here. So to get mg service principal, then I'm going to have to configure my logon with these. And I can just now go and connect mggraph and add these scopes in as part of the connection, as you saw before. So the next one is if you've gone to the, the graph API documentation and you've found the API that you need and it's got the actual end of the URI, you can use find mg graph command to show you commands that relate to that particular API. So this one, I've gone to documentation, I've looked at uh, the users, API and it's told me that actually if I put this in users and then the ID is the ID of the user you want to query, I can use in V1, so GA version, get MG user, remove MG user and update MG user. And in the beta API version, I've got the same command that's available to me. It shows me permissions, it tells me the type of object that is being output as well. So it's quite, it's very useful from that point of view. If we know permission as well, we can pipe it in to find MG graph permission and it tells us uh, some information about that permission. So this one is device management apps read all. I pipe it in, it tells me the permission types application while well, I requested application type. Um, but the description thing is useful here. So it allows the app to read the properties, group assignments and status of apps and app configurations. So if you see a permission you found and you're unsure about it, then actually you can pipe it in to find mggraph permission to get some more info as well. All right, so the last one in the toolbox was uh, oh, you can actually just pick out a particular word as well, and it shows all the permissions. But the last one in the toolbox was invoke mggraph request. And this lets you call the API directly, which is something that a lot of people that have been using Microsoft Graph API for a while are more familiar with. Uh, like I said before, you had to usually write your own wrappers for this. So this, this typically means you have to do more coding because of that, it's, it's the same situation. Uh, but actually it's, it's useful when we release the API and you've got that month wait between the API release and the actual module, graph PowerShell module being updated to include a command look for it. So we find a lot of people use this as a, as a stopgap in the interim. And here, all I'm gonna do is invoke the graph API and get some information about a user in my tenant. So pretty standard stuff so far, there we go. So some more tasks. Um, this one, directory size quota. So each AD tenant has a maximum number of objects that can be created in it. And this command shows your, your limit and it also shows your current consumption, which is really, really useful, especially for a lot of the customers that I, I deal with in terms of working out where they're going in, in the tenant. So that's this here. We can just run get MG organization directory size quota. Okay, the total available to me is 300,000 and I've just used 10,000 in this particular tenant. Now I mentioned before about some of the advanced filtering. 
um, we can use this GetMG device with something called consistency level that actually gives you access to another database to pull back count really easily. So what I'm doing here, as you can see, I'm, I'm running GetMG device. I'm saying use the consistency level eventual. So it's not going to go through and get every single device, but it's actually going, going to go off and, and do a count for me and, ass and assign it to this variable, which I'm then going to show. We're going to do a very similar thing with user count. So this time using invoke MG graph request. But the important thing here again is I'm putting this consistency level eventual into the header. And that allows me to do a count of the actual user objects. So I run both of those. We get the count. And you can see my, my tenant's mostly made up of user objects rather than device objects. But I wanted to include that because consistency level eventual catches a lot of people out. And um, we get questions, should we include this by default? And um, it's something that right now you have to uh, make explicit. So basically in the header here, put it in, or in the actual parameter here, specify it as well, consistency level eventual. So the next one is keys assigned to the user that logged in by the looks of it. So get MG user authentication FIDO2 method. The user ID is the one that I used, and I'm just going to actually show the display name. So this is going to be the key that I used to log in. Fine, it's taken a while. And I have two associated with that account. And this one that was used was actually the blue AAD one. I'm now going to get some last sign-in info for that particular user, um, but I'm going to put it, I'm going to use the debug parameter, which we recently introduced, and then use redirection to take the, re to take the debug stream uh, into a text file and then look in that text file. So a number of things going on there. Okay. so. Oh, that's interesting. It hasn't come back with any uh, sign-in information. It probably hasn't registered in the logs yet. And then here, from a troubleshooting perspective, to get content on that debug text file, and we've got a whole bunch of useful information in terms of what went on. So the actual call was successful. And actually, it's got information here. So why didn't it expose it up there? Good question. OK. Um, so the debug stream shows the information, interestingly. Onto some filtering. Um, I guess the thing to call out when using the graph PowerShell with a filter is that it uses OData filtering syntax. And there's things like EQ rather than dash EQ that bugged me for a long time because I kept putting dash EQ. But you can see very similar. So here we're saying filter user principal name equals this user, and then we're selecting so a bit of information. This one's slightly different. We can use starts with display name, starts with other display name, obviously start concatenating information as well. Uh, if I run those two, then pretty standard output really, as you'd expect. But yeah, using OData under the bonnet is the point there. Uh, this one is I'm going to get audit log for the app that I was using before. And I'm going to filter using this dynamic operator here saying that I just want information that relates to sign-in event types of service principle rather than user principle. And then if I run all of that, oh, I missed the, uh... okay. So you can see that my custom application, um, in terms of my time here, it was run at that point. So another use of this consistency level equals eventual is when you do search. So it's key for that as well. So it really speeds up the searching process. And here, the syntax, again, is, it, it is a little bit of a learning curve there. But I'm going to search on a display name for this particular user. i use consistency level eventual. And it just means that 
because it's graph. The search is very, very fast against my tenant. Okay, so almost at the end of this point, there's, I want to include this. So we can use this update MG policy authorization policy command that, to actually block MSN line PowerShell. So if you're sure there's no more usage of it in the environment, then we can turn it off. So here I'm going to turn it off and I'm going to look at the, the changed value. It's true. So I've now blocked the use of MS Online against that particular tenant. And finally, in this one, you to the point about having commandlets that you're playing catch up when it comes to, uh, or having a, an API sorry, that plays catch up when it comes to having a commandlet generated to get that right. Um, if it doesn't exist, then you can you can use it. So here I'm going to use find mg graph command to actually look at an API that I know is relatively new. Hopefully, because I wrote this content about a month ago, it's not had the command that developed yet, but the joys of demos, let's see. Uh, okay, so we're good. So here we're saying that that API doesn't have a command associated with it yet. So what I can then do is use this here to achieve something that used to frustrate me for a long time. So you know a tenant ID, you know the, the GUID that represents a tenant, but then, then how do you convert that back to a human readable domain name? Well, it used to be not an impossible, but now we have a, an API that you can do it with. So here I put a tenant ID in, I'm gonna do invoke graph request, and I'm gonna pull back the tenant information, all going to plan. Okay, so it just tells me some info now about my tenant. So I've taken that tenant ID and I convert it to a default domain name. Alrighty, so that's the end of that particular section. So at some point, you are going to need to move existing scripts to use Graph PowerShell. And we began putting together documentation to help with that process. Is there more to do? For sure. Um, but it, it's there as a starting point. And, and for example, we have here uh, two that are highlighted in yellow. We've got below there, it says commandlet map. So we've got an MS Online to Graph PowerShell commandlet map and a JD to Graph PowerShell commandlet map. Um, I was actually working on those this afternoon because there's more information we can put in them in them now as well. And more will follow in this space in terms of uh, also migration guidance, getting from A to B, tooling, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and there's, there's community tooling already happening as well, actually. Uh, and I'll talk about that a bit later. So when it comes to upgrading to Graph PowerShell, then I want to put in some points that will help you, will help you switch today, or even just start experimenting and looking at, at taking a script and, and running it through, through Graph PowerShell. So typically you'll find one-to-one -one functional mapping. Um, and by that, uh, I mean, if, if, if you take something like get Azure AD user, get MSL user even, you, you'll tend to find that it maps to get MG user. So that's a really good starting point. Um, is it always the case? No, there's sometimes some additional uh, command that's in graph PowerShell you have to take account of. But given that, make use of the commandlet map. So for those, those cases where there isn't necessarily one-to-one -one functional mapping. As mentioned, I'm, I'm going to work on additional migration tools and documentation, or, or we are as a team. And then use that notion of the toolkit. So that find MG graph permission, find MG graph command specifically to actually locate and, and call the MS Graph directly as well. So what does a migration process potentially look like? Um, well, here's some thoughts I put together. So document your current scripts and, and what kind of things do you want to capture? Well, purpose, obviously. So what is it the script is doing? Then command that's used, include, I, I would say including the number of calls of that of a particular command, look. the frequency of execution, um, what I mean by this is how often is the script run? Is it something that's done, that's done ad, hoc, ad hoc as an admin task? Or is it something that's actually uh, free, it run frequently as part of a scheduled job? Importance, this is very subjective, but actually in, in terms of business criticality, what is it doing and what would happen if it failed? 
the length. So that's an interesting one. So length of execution time, maybe, or I was actually thinking here, just the, the length of the script itself, which could be an indication of complexity. So number of lines involved. Location, so where is it executed, executed from and how? This is really important. This, this uh, yeah, upgrading isn't usually a really sort of welcomed activity, should we say, but it can be a very useful one. So it might be an opportunity to go and look through the various script repositories and, and, and ask the questions along the lines of, is it still required? Can we use functionality in the product now to achieve what the script was doing, is doing? So uh, improvement points. So notions that I'm sure you're all familiar with, so filter left, so where you can create your filters as far left in the pipeline as possible and do it server side. So make sure that we're filtering server side rather than client side. Authentication, can you, can you upgrade and use some of these modern authentication capabilities? Uh, does the script analyzer give you some useful hints? And then all of this should lead to a score and I put optional here, but I think this would be very useful. So if you weight these various things and, and, a, and apply a point system to them, you should end up with a score that hopefully gives you a view of what to upgrade and when. So when it comes to the process itself, start simple with a low score, obviously prove out the process that you've defined, map the commandlets themselves. So we talked about that one-to-one -one functional priorities to work out what maps to where, but really importantly as well, map parameters and switches. And also any sort of filters that you have, map how they would work. Check out the commandlet documentation that we'll have. And I would say on that one, this is, this is always a big feedback point, that documentation is targeted for human updates and they're frequently occurring. So you may have seen this, that in terms of inbuilt commandlet documentation and documentation that exists online, um, that has been enriched. For some, MS Graph Explorer is your friend. So you can test out essentially what it is um, that your new endpoint, your new API is doing. Really importantly, I think here, understand output objects. So potentially property names change, objects almost certainly change, but are you getting what you expect in terms of uh, what the actual new commander is bringing back. And then I mentioned this one before as well. So to use dedicated apps and adhere to least privilege. So the, the, the beauty of Graph PowerShell is that you can now set up separate apps for separate business processes and ensure that we have least privilege against those applications. So an application for a specific task in this instance. Okay, I don't know how I'm doing for time. Um, am I good? Oh no, I'm creeping up. So let me speed up a little bit. So I'm, I'm sure hopefully you want to ask some questions. So I put a section about contributing. I mentioned it before, this is all very much open source and graph PowerShell command that's are created by uh, this technology called auto rest, if you remember. And you can think of this as a foundational layer. So we create the commandlets here and, and they exist in the graph PowerShell SDK. Now on top of that layer, we have this notion of customizations. So these give you the ability to create additional functionality. If you look at each sub-module within Graph, um, they're found in, in the root of that sub-module. They can be written in script or they can be written in C-sharp. We prefer script. Um, they can be brand new commandlets. There can be additional variants on top of existing commandlets. It could be code that chains together a whole bunch of multiple commandlets within the module. And our feature teams are already using these to augment auto-generated commandlets. And for me, this is the future of, of the module in terms of making it you know, that first class IT pro IT admin module for administering Azure AD. Um, if you want a good example of what our feature teams have done, entitlement management customizations, it's a really good place to go. And I've got, I'll put a whole bunch of get started and other links on, on the next slide. And you know, we'd love you to take a look at this and start doing the same. There is one slight caveat. If you want to write your own customization, um, it's best to check with the actual graph team via, via an issue just to make sure that what you're doing makes sense and also uh, that we haven't already got it in the pipeline, pardon the pun. So uh, the final one here, and I won't dwell too long on that one as well because the time is, we have this other layer and we're trying to 
consolidate all the, the modules that we've created within our division into this one module now called Microsoft Identity Tools. There's a whole bunch of modules that over the years that we've created for specific purposes and they exist, I guess, outside of the, the normal official modules. And these, these have come into being because we've recognized the need that you know, there's a complex business problem that needs solving and we need to you know, write a script that provides really customized output. And so, so this next layer on top is Microsoft Identity Tools. And there's stuff that's going in there all the time now. And I'm driving the consolidation of all these existing modules into this as well, where appropriate. I mean, we're drop, driving, dropping off stuff that doesn't necessarily make sense. So again, please come and contribute to this if you have functions that you think should be in it. This is, I would say, unofficial compared to the other ones, but it's just another layer of abstraction on, on top of it. So there's various links, um, you'll get the deck, but the various, here we've got means of contributing and some of the actual modules we have, including DMS identity tools. Um, this next one refers to some recent community releases. Uh, for me, Fred's written this PS as your migration advisor. So it, it takes a script or it actually, he can, he, can, he can point it at a repository and it analyzes you know, how you take a to B, so where you've got MSO commandlets, as an example, how you would transform that to a graph commandlet. Um, likewise, one of my colleagues, Meryl, has written this conversion analyzer, which is just a, a web portal where you can put in your script as well, and it does a very similar thing. We've got a very new graph PowerShell samples repository on GitHub, so people are already dropping code in. And, and that's one of the things we find that it's generating that sort of interest and, and just providing these examples and, and how you pick up graph PowerShell will be really, really important. So that's in there as well. How to figure out what graph permissions you need is a, is a blog article that came out on the back of a presentation I did last month. Um, and then the last one is uh, Graph Permission Explorer, another tool that, that my colleague Meryl introduced. And that's really it. So thank you for me. I've hopefully left enough time for some questions, if there are any, but yeah. I, Anything from the room? Yeah, it's it's a, it's a good example of something that we know we need to fix. And that particular commandlet is one that there's been a lot of focus on. So, I mean, if, if there's specific, I mean, you mentioned just an example there, but it'd be great if you could just jot up the, the bits that you see are missing and send them across to me as well. But yeah, we we appreciate that that, that commandlet, I would say, is in a reasonable state, but there are others as well that suffer from that problem. And we appreciate that there's, a whole bunch of work that needs to be done around just clarifying how you pull information back. I suspect you may be able to get what you need, but using like additional properties, parameters, but I, we'd have to go and have a look. So yeah, it's th th those kind of things, I guess I could say is they're definitely known and we want to address them. Oh, of course not. That was one of my main reasons for doing this is just to meet everyone and, and actually yeah, I, I want that level of feedback so we can make sure that we're getting this right. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, thank you, everyone. Appreciate it.